that would be hopeless without your goodness I would be desperate without your love slave to the darkness if it wasn't for the cross you have won me with your kindness chase me down when I was lost Where would I be If it wasn't for the cross And hallelujah And thank you Jesus I was a prisoner Now I'm not Cause with your blood you And bought my freedom Hallelujah for the cross. All my shame was that with mercy, now your mercy would be my song and all the glory. Oh, the power of the cross And hallelujah Thank you, Jesus I was a prisoner Now I'm not Cause with your blood you And bought my freedom Hallelujah Oh, the cross And by your death I live The power of sin is overcome It is finished, it is done By your stripes I'm you And by your death I live The power of sin is overcome It is finished, it is done By your stripes I'm you And by your death I live The power of sin is overcome And by your death I live, the power of sin is overcome, it is finished, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not. Cause with your blood you have bought my freedom, oh hallelujah, oh the cross. Thank you, Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not, because with your blood you bought my freedom, oh, hallelujah, for the cross. Let's continue in worship as we go to the Lord in prayer. Will you pray with me? Father God, we just thank you so much, Lord. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be able to worship you this morning. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be able to gather together as a family and with our friends maybe, Lord, to be able to worship and sing praises to your name. And Father, now as we are about to sit under the teaching of your word, Father, we pray that you will apply your word to our lives. Father, we pray that we won't just be hearers, Lord, but we would be doers and be able to let's take what we hear from you, Father, and be challenged and equipped and encouraged um, 
through this morning's message. Father, I pray that you would, within each and every one of us, Lord, that you would encourage us to be able to share your love with others. Father, we are so grateful for just the blessings that you've given upon us. Father, we're grateful for, for good health. Father, for great, beautiful weather of living here in the valley. Um, and God, but we also pray for those who are struggling right now. God, I think about those who are dealing with, with sickness, Father, may it be the flu season or, or COVID or, or any other illness that they may be dealing with, Father. I pray that you would help um, bring people back to good health. Father, we pray that people who are struggling um, with difficulties in their marriage, Father, or their jobs or with their families, Lord, we pray that you would comfort them and encourage them during this time. Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment to be able to care and minister to people who are struggling. And Father, I pray that you would be with each and every one of us, Lord. I pray and ask that you would help us to be able to see our own hearts, Father, to find our own faults, Lord, and to, to feel that conviction. And Father, not to run away from it, Lord, but to embrace what you're calling us to become more like your son, Jesus. God, we just ask that you'll continue to do a mighty work within us, Father. Lord, we pray and hope that we would grow closer to you each and every day. Father, we pray that we take advantages of opportunities to be able to share your love with every woman, man, and child. God, we thank you for who you are. Father, we thank you so much for your son and your love for us. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. So, Father, now as we sit here, Father, I just pray that we just take a moment to be mindful for who you are and all that you've done, and all that you're continuing to do. God, we love you, and we're so grateful for you. Be with us now as we hear your word, and we ask this in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. I want you to take your Bibles or your apps or whatever you read on, and today we're gonna to be in Matthew chapter 13. Now, if you're not familiar with where Matthew's located in the Bible, uh, let me give you some clues, some hints on how to find it. If you're in a physical Bible, open up to the table of contents. That's the easiest way to locate Matthew. Uh, in the table of contents, you're gonna notice that there are two main sections, uh, uh, breakups uh, of the Bible. The first one is the Old Testament. The second one is the New Testament. Now, Matthew, uh, the book we're in today, is the first book of the New Testament. So table of contents, find the New Testament. First book in is Matthew. Go to that page and then keep flipping until you get to chapter 13. Now, if you're in a, an app, just pull down the list of the books of the Bible and you'll find Matthew is about three quarters of the way uh, down that list. So look for Matthew chapter 13. Now, as I've mentioned uh, in the past, and if you've kept up with our church over the past year, you know that I fell off my roof back in uh, April of last year, and it debilitated me. I was unable to do anything for about a month and a half. I was completely dependent on my wife and uh, friends and family that came to help out for pretty much everything. I could not eat on my own. I couldn't go to the bathroom on my own. I couldn't take a shower. I couldn't even get out of bed without the assistance of my wife or other people in my life. Have you ever been totally dependent on someone else for something in your life? Well, today we're going to talk about that. Uh, we've been in this series called The Church and Culture. And in this series, we've been discussing what it looks like to follow Jesus in a culture that isn't particularly fond of the followers of Jesus. Um, and we've been doing this by looking at what the Bible instructs us to do and by looking at examples of godly men and women who lived in cultures uh, that weren't exactly godlike uh, and what they did in order to live for Jesus in those kinds of cultures. Um, and so far, we've talked about the cultures of the Bible and how bad they were, uh, how good we've got it in today's culture and uh, when we do that comparison. 
We've talked about the fact that uh, God's word always trumps our opinions and we need to follow what his word says, not what we think is the right thing to do. Uh, we've talked about how we don't confuse the things we don't like with what God actually says in his word. And last week, we talked about the importance of trusting Jesus in the good and difficult times. Uh, no matter what's going on in the world around us, our trust is in him and him alone. And today we're going to take a look at what we need uh, in our lives in order to live for Jesus in this culture. Uh, what, we're, what we need to depend on, what we need to be dependent on. And so take your Bibles or your apps and turn with me to Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13. Now uh, we're going to pick up in verse 3. And in this passage, Jesus tells us a parable. Now, a parable is a story that has a double meaning. It's a, it's a story and it has an, a surface level meaning, but it has a deeper spiritual meaning to it and a, a spiritual lesson. And so we're gonna look at today's parable uh, found in Matthew 13. So pick up with me, Matthew 13, starting in verse three. It says this, and Jesus told them many things in parables saying, a sower went out to sow and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. Verse five, other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and immediately sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them out. Verse eight, other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, this is, uh, a, again, a parable. It tells a story about a sower who goes out and, and spreads seed. And as he's spreading seed, the seed falls on various types of soil uh, in that area. Now, of course, there is a deeper meaning to this. You see, uh, in this parable, the sower is God. It's Jesus. And the seed that he is spreading is the word of God, the gospel message of Jesus, the gospel message being the good news about Jesus's life, his death and resurrection, and his love for us and how he forgave us through that death and resurrection. So the, the seed is that godly gospel message, the word of truth. Um, and the soil that the seed falls on are people's hearts. Uh, their minds and their hearts. The different soils produce different, uh, pr uh, produce different results. Uh, some people, uh, some hearts, the, the gospel falls on them, it comes to them, and they produce, that, 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 that gospel produces nothing at all. But it does tell us that if that seed, if that gospel message falls on good soil, then it's going to produce hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. It's going to produce so much out of that seed falling on the good soil, the good heart. Um, and, and Jesus explains this, but but let me be very clear: we need Jesus for everything. Think about as we go through the explanation, Jesus explains the meaning of this parable and we're gonna look at that in, in just a moment. But think about as we look at Jesus's explanation, think about how essential Jesus is in this entire parable. In every aspect of this parable, Jesus is what is necessary to produce the fruit or produce the grain in these different soils. So. Jesus gives an explanation to his disciples uh, regarding the meaning of this parable. So pick up with me in verse 18. Verse 18, it says this, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what is sown along the path. So, so the, the seed falls on someone. In other words, the gospel is received by someone and they don't understand. They're confused by it. And rather than going and finding answers to the questions or clarity to their confusion, 
they just don't do anything. And as a result, that good, godly message, that hope, that life-changing hope of Jesus that, that they've been introduced to, because they're confused and because they don't go and seek clarification or answers, Satan, the, the, the adversary, the evil one, comes and just takes it away. There, there's, there's literally no growth whatsoever in that kind of soil. Now look with me at the next one, verses 20 through 21. Now as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. And so this is the person that hears the gospel, receives the gospel message, the good news of Jesus, they receive it and they are excited about it. They're filled with joy and they, they love the idea of this life-changing hope of Jesus that they've heard about. But when things get tough because of uh, Jesus, when people start persecuting them, uh, when people start mocking them or, or when sacrifice is required to follow Jesus, they give up on that good news. So, so it was never true faith. It was never true belief. It was just a, a initial joy and excitement about something that they had gotten, but it wasn't real. It hadn't taken root inside of them. Okay, let's look at the next one. Verse 22, it says, and as for the, what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word out and it proves unfruitful. Now, this is the person who receives the gospel. They hear the good news. And again, just like the previous one on the rocky ground, they get excited about it and they, they, they maybe start going to church or they start uh, maybe the beginning stages of possibly having faith. But their love for worldly things, riches or uh, popularity or, or comfort that the world sometimes tries to provide, those things distract them and become idols in their lives. In other words, they worship and value the things of the world more than what Jesus offers them. And so because they worship the money and the, the, the values that this world brings, they fall away. And again, their faith was never true to begin with. They, they are distracted by the idolatry, the things they value more than Jesus and they never actually come to true belief in him. You see, when we follow Jesus, there is no distraction, there is no thing on this earth, money or, or values or, or worldly uh, you know, issues, there's nothing that we can place as equal or more important than God. God is everything, Jesus is everything. We need Jesus for everything. And so, this person gets distracted basically by the things of the world and they lose what, what they had, what that gospel message had brought to them. Now look with me finally at the last soil, verse 23. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another 60 and in another 30. So Jesus is telling us that this last soil receives the gospel, the good news message of Jesus, and it plants inside of this person. In other words, they place Jesus and the gospel as the top priority. Nothing is more important than Jesus. And as a result, their life is changed because of the life-changing hope in Jesus. Their life is changed and their life produces fruit. And we're gonna talk about what fruit is here in just a moment, so stick with me. I, I think that this is vital though. We need to understand that we cannot bear good fruit, we cannot produce good fruit without being good soil. So the question this morning is what kind of soil are you? Are you the 
the, the path where the seed doesn't produce anything, it doesn't even take root? Are you the, the rocky ground where it springs up quickly, but as soon as things gets tough, it dies off? Are you the, the, the uh, soil that has the thorns and the weeds in it, where it, you know, the, it springs up, the, the, the word is received, but as soon as they get distracted by the things of the world, they, it dies off, it falls away? Or are you the good soil? Now, I would venture to say that most of you listening right now are probably followers of Jesus. And you're saying, oh, well, of course I'm the good soil because I'm listening to this sermon right now. I, clearly, because I'm, I'm viewing and listening this sermon and I've got my Bible open and I do this on a regular basis, clearly I am good soil. But let's be honest for a minute the Bible actually contradicts that statement and research contradicts it as well. The Bible does not say that most people who watch sermons or go to church or open their Bibles, most people are not actually followers of Jesus. Let me, let me just talk about this for just a moment. Uh, let's look at the research first. A few years ago, uh, a research group called Barna. Barna is a Christian research group. Uh, they're doing studies all the time about where Christianity in the United States is going and, uh, and where people are who attend church and things like that. They did a, a poll a few years ago uh, amongst people who attend church, regular attenders. So these are people that attend church uh, two, three, four times a month. They, they are involved in their church to some level. So they did research, uh, did a poll amongst people who are ch regular church attenders, and they asked them a series of questions to test whether or not those attenders were actually people that the Bible would define as Jesus followers. And here's the thing. They found that only 60% of church attenders were actually biblically defined as followers of Jesus. In other words, 40%, four out of 10 people who attend church regularly aren't actually followers of Jesus as the Bible defines it. That's a problem. The, the, there's, it's not a majority, but, but almost half of the people who attend church online or attend church uh, in person aren't actually Christians. They claim to be, but guys, they're not actually people. According to what God's word says and how it defines a follower of Jesus, they're not actually people who are true followers, who are true believers in Jesus. It's an illust it goes back to an illustration I used a few years ago. Uh, I can sit in a car and uh, I can sit in a garage uh, and I can make vroom vroom sounds and, and I can do all sorts of things, but none of those things make me a car. Your church attendance does not make you a Christian. The production of fruit is what makes you a follower of Jesus. But, but that's not all that we're looking at here. Look at what God's word actually says about this. In Luke chapter three, verses seven through 14, uh, we, found Jesus, we find it saying this, Luke three, uh, seven through 14, this is John the Baptist speaking. He says, it says this, he said therefore to the crowds that came out to be baptized, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees and every tree therefore that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? Verse 11, and he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, what shall we do? 
And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be content with your wages. You see, John the Baptist taught uh, that, that there's a huge portion of people who claim to be followers of God and yet they're not. If you continue reading uh, in God's word in Matthew chapter seven, we read this interesting statement by Jesus. Matthew seven, verses 21 through 23 say this, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is hard to hear. Jesus is speaking very clearly to those who think they follow Jesus and look at their claim. They claim to prophesy in his name, cast out demons in his name and do mighty works in the name of Jesus. And yet Jesus still looks at them and says, I don't even know you. The fact of the matter is, is attending church and reading the Bible and all of those things, those don't make us followers of Jesus. The proof, the evidence that we are followers of Jesus is in the fruit that we produce, the fruit that our lives produce. So back to the question, what soil are you? According to the parable, that we just went through, we need to clarify some things. The parable indicates that the, the true follower of Jesus, the good soil will produce fruit. So maybe a better question is, what fruit is my faith producing for and through the gospel? Did you know that spiritual fruit is spoken about over 50 times throughout the Bible? Uh, the, word, the, the word fruit in connotation to spiritual fruit is used many, many times, more, way more than 50. But discussions about what spiritual fruit is, is discussed over 50 times. It is a common theme throughout God's word that, that our lives will produce a spiritual fruit. And there are three things that that spiritual fruit always refers to, one of these three things. The first one, spiritual fruit is righteous living. In other words, living for God. It is a, it is a life of doing what God tells us to do, okay? The second spiritual fruit is living in a way that is Jesus-like. And you say, well, aren't those first two the same, there's, there's a, a subtle difference between these two. It's one thing to be a moral person, but it's a different thing to live a Christ-like life. Uh, so being a moral person, you're not cheating on your spouse, you're not stealing money, you're, uh, you're not a, a liar, you don't, you don't tell lies all the time, those kinds of things. But living a Christ-like life is living out the fruit of the spirit that we find in Galatians 5. So if you go to Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23, Paul says this, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so living a Christ-like life means being a person that, that values love over their opinions or, or over themselves even. Uh, living a Christ-like life is a joyful life. Guys, I know a lot of people who claim to be Christians and I have never seen them smile or express joy. Living a Christ-like life is a life of peace, not one of contention uh, or arguments or debates. There are places for having discussions about our faith. But again, as I mentioned last week, 1 Peter chapter 3 says that we're to do that with gentleness and respect, seeking peace. A Christ-like life is a life of patience. 
It's a life of being kind to people around you. Even when they mistreat you, we are still kind to others. We're especially kind to those who are fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Following Christ and being, living a Christ-like life is a life of goodness. It's a life of faithfulness, which we've been discussing today and last week. It's a life of gentleness and it's a life of self-control. You see there, there's a subtle difference between simple obedience to God, you know, following the moral uh, direction that God has given us and living a Christ-like life. It's more, living a Christ-like life is, is more about attitude uh, and our, our, our general uh, demeanor around people as we live our lives. So spiritual fruit, it always refers to one of three things, either righteousness, Christ-like life, Christ-like behavior, or lastly, it's leading others to Jesus. Now in the parable that we read today from Matthew 13, that's the meaning. Uh, When it's talking about spiritual fruit that the good soil produces, it's specifically talking about leading others to the life-changing hope of Jesus. And so where are you in regards to producing fruit? Are you living a righteous life, living the the life that you're doing the things that Jesus, that God commands you to do? Are you living a Christ-like life? Are you living out the fruit of the spirit that's found in Galatians 5? And lastly, are you leading every generation to the life-changing hope of Jesus? That is producing spiritual fruit. And it's not one of, uh, well, I'm producing the first one, but maybe not so much the second or third one. No, when we're talking about producing spiritual fruit as a proof that we are good soil, it's all three. It's producing all three of those things. Good fruit will produce righteous life. It will produce a Christ-like life and it will lead others to Jesus. So what kind of, a fruit are you producing for the gospel? That's the question for this morning. Now you may be asking this. We're in this series called The Church and Culture and we're discussing how to live our lives as followers of Jesus in a culture that doesn't particularly like the followers of Christ. So how does today's discussion, how does producing fruit, how does that fit in with today's series, with this message series that we've been in? Well, here's how this fits, and this is today's big idea. And I've actually mentioned it a couple of times already in the sermon, in the message this morning, but today's big idea is this. We need Jesus for everything. We need Jesus for everything. You see, being good soil is something that we are completely dependent on Jesus to be. You see, you can't be good soil without Jesus. Jesus and his gospel are everything. You can't be a good enough person. You can't donate enough money. You can't serve enough. It's only through Jesus and his power through you, his sustaining through you that you can be good soil and produce fruit. You can't do it on your own. And in the next few weeks, we're gonna go through what I'm calling counterfeit fruit. Uh, For the next few weeks after this week's message, we're gonna talk about these counterfeit fruit, these things that we tend to look to to get us through today's world. Those things that whether we realize it or not, we place unwarranted trust in. And hear me, Jesus is the only way to be good soil. Jesus is the only way to produce good fruit. He's the only way to live a righteous life, to live a a Jesus-like life, and to lead others to the life-changing hope of Jesus. He is the only way. There's no other way to do that. You can't be good enough. You can't do it on your own. You can't donate enough. You can't serve enough. You can't be a good enough person to do what we're talking about, to be good soil. You need Jesus and the gospel for all of it. It is impossible to do any of the things that I've talked about today 
It is impossible to do them without Jesus. It's impossible to do any of these things without Jesus doing them through you. So we need Jesus. So let's go back to the question I asked earlier. Are you good soil? What fruit are you producing in your life? Righteousness, Jesus-like living, and leading every generation to the life-changing hope of Jesus. Are you solely focused on these things? And are you solely focused on doing them through the power of Jesus? You see, if you want to live as a follower of Christ in a culture that doesn't like the followers of Christ, you need Jesus to do that. Jesus is the only way. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for this time and this opportunity that we have today to lean completely on you. And Lord, our prayer this morning is that you would help us to know and understand what your leading is in our life, that we would live uh, a righteous life, that we would live a Jesus-like life, and that we would lead others to the life-changing hope that can only be found in Jesus. Help us to be good soil. Help us to produce fruit. We thank you, Lord, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In today's message, I spoke about being good, f good soil and producing good fruit for Jesus. And maybe you've watched today and maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you've never come to belief in him. And this is a special message just to you. If you've never become a follower of Jesus, please hear me. You need Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. You see, we have all disobeyed God's perfect plan for our lives. We've all fallen short. Uh, we're all imperfect. Every human ever born, except for Jesus himself, is imperfect. And we need Jesus in order to uh, have forgiveness of our sins and to receive eternal life instead of eternal punishment. Uh, and I hope that through today's message that that. Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, is, is stirring something up inside of you. And if that's happening, if you've got questions, if you want to know more, please don't be like that first soil. Remember the, the seed that fell on the path? The, the, the meaning of that was the birds came and they snatched up those seeds immediately. The meaning behind that was that, that, that some people hear the gospel message. They hear about Jesus and they get confused by it or they've got questions and they never go out and seek the answers or the clarity that they need in order to understand who Jesus is. And please, if that's you, if you're confused or about who Jesus is and what we've been talking about, if you've got questions about what following Jesus looks like, please get those questions answered. Get clarity to that confusion. Please reach out to us. Uh, here's how I want you to do that. I want you to go down to the, the post part, the words of this video. Um, and in that post, there's a link to an online connect card or a virtual connect card. Click that link. It'll take you to our website, to the contact us page. And when you get there, there's a short little form. I want you to just fill that out. It's gonna send me your contact information and I'll reach out to you um, and answer any questions that you might have about Jesus. But please, if you've got questions or you need clarity, please get those questions answered. Don't keep going without understanding what we're talking about here. You see, Jesus loves you and he wants you to believe in him and for to be forgiven and rescued from your sins. And, and I don't want questions or confusion to get in the way of that. So please reach out to us. Go to our website, click on the contact us page and reach out to us today so that you can get those questions answered and get any clarity uh, that you may need in any confusion that you may have. So please reach out to us now and we would love to talk to you and answer any questions you might have about Jesus.